Test Geek and Zam Prep LLC. I want to come to you today uh, to talk about a couple of concepts that you may encounter on the Series 65 exam. Um, it's relatively new, fresh kind of concepts I hadn't heard uh, in quite some time on the Series 65, uh, and it deals with real estate. Hence the title, Make it, uh, Let's Get Real Estate. Okay, so some of these questions that you may come across on the Series 65 exam. For example, can you put real estate in an IRA, in a qualified retirement plan? Um, the answer is yes. However, could it be your personal residence? Could it be uh, a secondary home, a secondary residence? How about a, uh, uh, a timeshare property, right? That's not written very well, is it? Uh, let's see, timeshare. Or what about a business property of some sort? Okay? Been ambiguous as to what that may be. Okay? Second residence. There you go. Okay. So again, which of the following real estate or properties might uh, be in an IRA? May you put into an IRA? Now, uh, when I first saw this question, there was one thing that kind of popped out to me. Okay. Notice these three things. Okay. An individual will typically have personal use of these three things. The business property, again, it's a bit ambiguous, but I don't think you could necessarily always say that it would be used for personal use. So the answer, of course, then, would be business property. That is the key IRS rule. You cannot have personal use of the property okay, if you put it into your IRA. So don't be surprised if you may come across a real estate in an IRA question, okay? All right, uh, next, uh, and we find this uh, quite often in some of our financial planning. Uh, we have an older couple. They bought their home, you know, in 1982 or something for $150,000. Now they're retired. They want to move uh, to Florida or Phoenix or uh, who knows, right? And they want to sell their house. So they sell their property today, 30 years later, 35 years later, something like that, for $750,000. Okay. What is their capital gain? Okay. Uh, let's just throw some numbers at you. Let's say 100000 Let's say six hundred thousand, uh, five hundred thousand. Oh, and let's for fun just say seven hundred fifty thousand. Okay, something like that. Well, whenever you sell your home, there is a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar exemption per individual. So for a married couple, that actually would be twice that amount. Right? For a couple filing jointly, a married couple filing jointly, that would be a $500,000 exemption on a capital gain. So obviously, it's a 600 k gain minus the $500,000 exemption, and the capital gain would then be $100,000. Okay? So a taxable question, you know, kind of a real life question. You know, we see this, we come across some of our customers who are doing some financial planning, uh, might come across some of our uh, newly retired customers, okay? So don't be surprised to see a question that may ask you the capital gains on, on real estate. Now, as far as an investment choice, right, I have, uh, customers or had customers who invested primarily in real estate as well as securities. Uh, it was part of their portfolio, so we, uh, shall we say? Okay. Now, investments in real estate 
uh, can act as a very good hedge against inflation. I think traditionally, okay, now don't lock me down on this, but traditionally I think real estate has appreciated over a long period of time about 5% a year, right? Which in most cases, especially the last 20, 30 years, has outpaced inflation, right? So real estate about 5% appreciated per year over a very long time could actually provide a hedge against inflation. Now, that may be a testable question in itself when you're asking specifically about real estate, but you know something? Another traditional uh, investment choice for a hedge against inflation has always been precious metals. And I guess you can say gold specifically, precious metals generally. Okay? But notice, what do these two things have in common? Now, I haven't seen this term specifically show up in the 65. I have on some of the related NASA exams. These are both what's considered to be uh, tangible assets. So in a more ambiguous answer choice, if this course is a test question, any one of these terms could be the correct answer to that. Okay? I've seen gold used. I'm now hearing sometimes that real estate is being used. Or in a more ambiguous answer choice, simply the term tangible assets, because that's exactly what those are, tangible physical assets. Okay? Another potential test question showing up on the Series 65 that involves real estate. Okay? All right. Uh, one last one, uh, and I don't know if you really want to consider it a real estate question. Okay? Uh, it's actually a question more about referral fees, referral, uh, client referrals, and whether IAs can pay them, and whether they have to be registered, and that kind of thing. Okay? Now, uh, when it comes to client referrals, now this, I'm telling you, is always on the test, has been as long as I've been around these exams, which is more than 20 years, uh, as well as this term, advisor solicitor. Now, every time I do a class on this, uh, I always tell people you can expect at least one question and I would probably put down a little money that you're going to get more than one question on these two things. Now, if you read it in some of the textbooks, this concept can get kind of confusing. So in my classes, what I usually tell people is to separate these two as two completely separate entities. Okay? Where in the textbook, it sounds like it's one and the same. Okay? But in the real world, um, they're really kind of two different things. Okay? However, from a legal standpoint, they, they, they can kind of blend and, and together and, and get really confusing. So let's try to separate it out, make it a little bit less confusing for test purposes. Okay? Now, let's first talk about an advisor solicitor, okay? which, if you read the textbook or simply take the term literally, it sounds like an individual, someone who is soliciting on behalf of the advisor. Okay? However, in reality, what it oftentimes is in the real world is actually a firm, probably a very small a firm uh, started by a couple of people, maybe mom and pop or something like that, right? They're too small to actually go register as their own broker dealer or as their own IA, okay? It's a small financial services firm. However, if they want to give advice or sell securities, right, since they're not registered as broker dealers or IAs, they generally will have to affiliate themselves with an IA or broker dealer. I don't know if you've ever heard of LPL, uh, which stands for Linsco Private Ledger. They are the largest independent IA that a lot of these small kind of local financial firms will affiliate themselves with. 
There's several of these out there. Commonwealth, uh, they're based out of uh, Boston, I believe, is another one. Sun America, I believe, might be one. Centra Securities. There's several of these independent IAs that many of these small local financial firms will affiliate themselves with. So now they go out and solicit clients, either for on the security side or the advisory side, Right? They're now soliciting customers on behalf of the IA. Now, as you know, we are required to provide all of our customers with a disclosure brochure, whether that is Form ADV, which most people use, part two of course, or some glossy brochure, which is fine, Okay? You know, if you're a lot larger IA and you've got a big marketing budget, you know, who wants a stodgy old form that you send to the SEC? Right? Instead, make some glossy brochure, which, which works as long as all the required disclosure uh, information is there. Okay? So anyway, so we have to provide a disclosure brochure to every customer, we know that, but now because of this third party kind of situation, we also have to provide an advisor solicitor brochure as well that the customer must sign, right? The IA wants to know that the customer is aware that there's this advisor solicitor relationship. So we just keep records of that to make sure that the customer is aware, okay? So we have additional disclosure because of this kind of third party situation. Also, mom and pop or whomever runs this financial services firm have to be registered, of course, as IARs. They are physically providing advice on behalf of the IA, therefore they have to register and provide additional disclosures in addition to the form ADV. Okay? So that's an advisor solicit. That, that's pretty plain and simple. I don't think most people have problems with that. So you can understand it, it's rational, it's logical. But try reading it in the textbook, it doesn't sound like that at all. It really doesn't. Okay? Now, there's another scenario where we have, let me just slide forward a little bit, is a client referral. You know, we deal with a lot of professionals in our business, accountants. Uh, attorneys, uh, you know, estate attorneys and trust account attorneys, and, uh, mortgage lenders, you know, we, there's a whole network of professionals, especially that our clients are generally deal with, right? Accountants, attorneys, mortgage lenders, all sorts of things. Now, we, as an IA, might have associations. Oh my goodness, there's all sorts of networking situations out there. I uh, just joined one called Alignable, which is kind of local. And of course, there's LinkedIn and all of these kind of networking uh, platforms out there now, right? So, you know, you might be connected to a CPA or an attorney of some sort, okay? Or a mortgage lending company, or perhaps the real estate agent, okay? And there's where the real estate comes in, okay? So, any of these professionals outside of our industry may refer customers our way. And we may pay them, okay? Now, this is not an IA solicitor. Notice, it's not even the same scenario, okay? They're just saying, hey, I think Bob and Mary Jones might benefit from your advisory services. Here they are. You get them, you put them, you know, you get them as a client, and you pay the guy 500 bucks for the referral. Boom, done. Now, is he being compensated for any of the financial advice? No, it's a fixed flat fee for the referral. That's it, which is fine. Does that mean they have to register as IAs or IARs? No, <laughs> okay? They don't have to do any of that stuff. Now, again, the requirements for this is that referral fee must be a fixed and or flat rate. 
Okay, like 500 bucks. Here you go, Joe. There's 500 bucks. Thanks for the referral. Appreciate it. It cannot be tied to the amount of advisory fees. Because guess what? That sounds like now he's starting to receive a part of the advisory fee. That's a whole different ballgame. Now we start talking about advisor solicitors because they're getting an IA fee. Say that's a client referral is permitted as long as it's fixed and flat, right? If it's based on a percentage of the advisory fees, that is prohibited unless they register as IARs and all of that stuff, okay? In the textbooks, they just make it sound like these two people are the same thing. For test purposes, keep them separate, okay? They are generally not the same thing. These are actual firms that are in business of providing advice to customers. They're affiliated with IAs and thus uh, additional disclosure and they have to register as IARs. For these outside professionals simply referring people to us, Right? They're not giving that advice to the customers. They're not receiving a fee based on that advice. It's simply a fixed flat fee. They don't have to register as IARs unless they start doing this. It's prohibited for a referral fee to be based on a percentage of the fees. Because then they would have to go out and register as IARs and all that stuff. Okay? Keep it simple if you can. I'm telling you, all the textbooks I've written, and, I, and they're all pretty much the same. Because to be quite honest with you, if you read the actual law in either the Uniform Securities Act or the Investment Advisor Act of 40, it sounds really gray and ambiguous. It's hard to understand. So for you and I, right, we're out there in the trenches, we're in there trying to take this and pass this exam, keep them separate. They're two completely separate entities. Right? One's an actual firm, right? And one's a, you know, a, a, an outside business professional of some sort receiving a flat fee. Okay? So, uh, again, that's where the real estate comes in for this one. It's not really a real estate question per se, but they can use that real estate agent as uh, a client referral. Okay? All right, so I just wanted to show you some of the uh, questions that uh, I've been hearing. Uh, popping up on the Series 65. Uh, if you want to find the entire video course, of course, uh, you can go on to testgeekexamprep.com. That's our website. Find the uh, box. It's usually close to a thumbnail video of, of your, yours truly. Uh, and the black box says view videos, I do believe. And you click onto that, and that'll send you to the video course platform where you can find the Series 65 and have the entire course, okay? Where again, we discuss this as well uh, in a little bit more general terms, uh, but this is a little bit more specific for test purposes, okay? I hope that helps. Hey, if you have any questions, comments, opinions, editorials, uh, whatever, please feel free to drop me a line. Brian at testgeekexamprep.com. I'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, if uh, if uh, anything else comes up, you know, please feel free. Uh, I do one-on-one -on -one tutoring as well. Uh, the video course should take care of most of uh, what you need, but I can do one-on-one -on -one Skype tutoring as well. So again, any questions, comments, please feel free to drop me a line. I talk to people from all over the country. It's a lot of fun. Uh, hope that helps. I uh, hope I see you down the road. Take care. See you soon. Bye-bye.